Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> this is 75 Reads. I'm Joe Bozarth. And I'm April Bowlby. Oh, and we had a hard time pushing the start button, but here we are. We have started. <laughs> here we are. Welcome back. Here we go with The Divided Self um, by R.D. Lang. It, yes. This book, I hope... You read it because maybe you could help uh, me out. L- l- look at you. Open the book. It says "The Divided Self: An Existential Study in Sanity and Madness." I think that says it all. It really does. You know, in April, this is my first read on um, using the Kindle app. I always like to have a, a hard copy. I just like to feel it. I like to turn the pages. And this book, I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna see. I'm gonna download it, and if I love it, I'll buy the hard copy. I I enjoyed it. I don't think I'm going to buy the hard copy of this book. No, uh, I don't think there's a need. It's a study. It literally is a clinical study, it feels like. And it makes a lot of sense um, why this is on Bowie's reading list. But unless you, I feel like unless I was affected by someone with uh, schizophrenia, then I would have more glue to the book. I would, I would really study it. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's heavy. It's, um, it's, it's a study. It's a, well, you know, I was like, okay, so what's existentialism? It's, it's a philosophical movement that stresses the individual's unique position as a self-determining agent responsible for making meaningful, authentic choices in a universe seen as purposeless or irrational. Okay. Ah. Then Lang goes on to say that, uh, I mean, those weren't his words. I, I got the definition. Um, right. He goes on to say that this study is not a direct application of any established existential philosophy, but then he just acknowledges that his main intellectual indebtedness is to the existential tradition. So I'm like, okay, all right, then here we go. So, here we go. Here we go. Um, oh. I just want to get that all out of the way so we know where our D is coming from. Right. But yeah, yeah. That's very nice. this book, um, it's a lot yeah. of talk that I think if you're trained in psychology, if you've got that background, you're going to get it. But if not, it's a lot of work. And I can see making, like you said, April, I can see making the effort to read it if you're looking for answers, if you really want to understand someone who you know personally why he is the way or she is the way he or she is. So, right. so yes, it makes sense that Bowie would want to read this book. Um, his brother, Terry, uh, who, according to what I've read, was schizophrenic. And I can just imagine Bowie, Bowie sitting in a library because this book was published in, what, 1960, mm-hmm. I think. So I can imagine him as a young man reading this book in the library, like with a bunch of, like, what, Encyclopedia Britannica. Like, oh, let me look this up. Or, or not, but he's a genius, so maybe he just knew this stuff. Like, but I would today be Googling all of it if I really wanted to understand. I'd be Googling every five minutes. Agreed. Yes. I, it was, it will, look, it, <laughs> it, it needed a lot. I'd say, uh, as I like to say, this book has everything Shakespeare, Keats, and Kafka. Like, <laughs> 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 this book has everything. <laughs> oh my god! Okay. Uh, All right. Tell us what you found of so, about both. So here's the thing. Yes, and that's why I think it was interesting, and that's what I'm mostly going to talk about. Because look, if we really dive into the, the nitty gritty of this book, we're going to have a five hour episode, and nobody wants that. So, um, Let's see. so. <laughs> So Bowie's mother, Peggy, uh, she was the oldest of six children. At the age of 22, she met a French fellow and became pregnant and gave birth to Terry, a Bowie's older brother. Um, the French fellow disappeared. Peggy's mother, um, Bowie's grandmother named Margaret, uh, looked after Terry from the age of six months on because there was a huge, back in the day, there was a huge stigma of, um, illegitimacy it was it was it was just a big stigma so so they kind of hit it Ter- terry's uh terry was taken care of by his grandmother and a little background on that is that three of peggy's siblings 
were quote unquote psychotic. So Terry was now being raised by a woman who had nurtured, you know, three quote unquote psychotic children. Um, wow. Margaret, the grandmother, was emotionally abusive to Terry. And according to the article I read, and there were several articles, so I I am actually taking mine for or this from uh, one written by Oliver James, published in July 2016 for Telegraph. Dot co dot uk if you guys want to look it up but uh so anyway margaret um in one instance terry was being reprimanded by her and he smirked probably out of nervousness and she said go on laugh again and he nervously did so she smacked the little boy across the ear and said that'll teach you to laugh at me like yeah. so the article goes on to say that such abuse is the single strongest childhood predictor of schizophrenia more so even than sexual abuse um, so Peggy, wow. the mother, uh, Bowie's mother remarried or got married in 1946 to David Jones, Bowie's father and gave birth to Bowie. And, uh, I mean, sorry, not David Jones. That's Bowie to John Jones, Bowie's father gave birth to David Jones, which who we now know and love is David Bowie. Uh, and John Jones was reported to be an affectionate father to his son. He took him to concerts, bought him a saxophone, um, and then Terry came to live with the family shortly after David Bowie was born. And uh, Terry, I think, was age nine at the time. And the article says that Terry knew that the Frenchman was the love of Peggy's life. And uh, Bowie's dad knew that. And so he treated Terry not so great because Terry's father was his wife's first love. So Terry right. wasn't treated very well. Bowie was treated well. Terry was not. Um, and in 1967, the cum- cumulative effects of the emotional abuse by the grandmother being unwanted and stigmatized in uh, you know, the home of John Jones, uh, he, he cracked. He, he had his first psychotic episode in which he saw a blinding white light and Jesus Christ appeared telling him he had been picked for a special mission. Um, So Bowie, uh, actually, there's a line about this incident. Um, It is a crack in the sky and a hand pointing down at me. Um, It's in the song, All You Pretty Young Things. I mean, All You Pretty Ah, Things, All You Pretty Things. That line is in the song, and it harkens back to his brother's uh, first psychotic episode. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. So go take a listen to All You Pretty Things. Um, and there it is. So Terry spent the rest of his life in and out of mental hospitals. So his incident happened at a pretty young age because typically uh, schizophrenics don't experience the first symptoms until between ages 16 and 30. Um, and wow. it's young, men experience them younger than women. Um, but anyhow, so so while Terry's childhood was a textbook case of, of the causes of psychosis, Bowie, uh, the article very, I think, astutely points out that Bowie had the right mix of emotional neglect and entitlement to be able to face his childhood demons through creativity, which I think most artists do, right? I think, wow, so people, kids who come from this, they either end up with some major issues or they become artists so yeah they find a channel a way to get it out oh so i mean imagine bowie and he loved his brother and and then this happened so later i i believe the year was uh, yeah 86 i believe that uh terry uh ended his own life on a train track so, wow. of course, that's going to affect his brother, you know? Yes. Obviously. Obvious. And then yeah. there's also got to be an underlying fear of, you know, back then, everyone said it's hereditary. And so you got to kind of wonder, so when's the other shoe going to drop? When am I going to have that psychotic break? Which thankfully right, really never exactly. happened. And we're now learning isn't really necessarily hereditary, isn't always caused by a brain trauma. It can be you know, verbal, emotional abuse in childhood. It can. Right. 
Oh my gosh, it's really heartbreaking. I mean, it, one of the things that they kept saying in the book was that uh, there's a guilt uh, that drives the the psychosis, like that that they don't belong, yeah. and there's this, like massive guilt that they shouldn't be there, um, a guilt for living, and they they want to disappear, but they can't disappear, so they create these worlds for themselves. Um, and in the book, they're, they're constantly, everyone, it seems like, what does it say? It says a schizophrenic uh, wants three things, to get the breast, so like be taken care of, to be yeah. loved, but then they're, they're also trying to die, but then they're trying not to yes. die. So they're creating these worlds and stories for themselves because they have these things to fulfill for themselves so they can... It, it's it's so sad that it stems it seems to stem from like a very traumatic experiences um and that's how the the, the mind fractures itself to survive yes. um, yeah. well so, yeah there was that part like you're talking about the world and it says man cannot exist without his world nor can his world exist without him i think on that like you live in your world like the world is you april perceive it i live in my world the world is i per- perceive it and there are billions of worlds walking around out here and when i die my world ceases to exist but the world goes on and it's just it's fascinating so it's talking like the part about the unreal man so if a man tells us he is an unreal man and he is if he is not lying or joking or equivocating in some subtle way there is no doubt he will be regarded as deluded but existentially what does this delusion mean indeed he is not joking or pretending on the contrary he goes on to say that he has been pretending for years to have been a real person but can maintain the deception no longer his whole life he has been torn between his desire to reveal himself and his desire to conceal himself. We remember in childhood telling our first lie, in our fear and our trembling, what an accomplishment it was. In doing this, we discovered that we were alone in certain respects, but we knew that in the territory of ourselves, there can only be our footprints. But there are people who never fully get this. Like Genuine privacy is based on genuine relationship. And the person we call a schizoid feels both more exposed, more vulnerable to others than we do, and more isolated at the same time. And so a schizophrenic may say that he's made of glass, such transparency, like you were saying, that a look Mm. directed at him splinters him to bits and penetrates straight through him. So the author suggests that this extreme vulnerability made this unreal man so adept at self-concealment, he learned to cry when he was amused and to smile when he was sad. And that is just heartbreaking to me. Like in some instances... You just, you really believe that the abusive parents did this, did this. Right. And you can see how kids are at a higher risk when parents are verbally abusive. Abusive. Well, because the mind can, it needs to be shaped. It's, it's right. And if you shape it in a warped way, then it, it like, is like, oh, these are the rules. Oh, this doesn't work for me. And, and then you kind of, uh, just uh, it's interesting that there's it's very not that it's very common but it's common enough that um it, that it's common enough yeah. i guess w- which is really sad um they said in the book they said the cracked mind of the schizophrenic may let in light which does not enter the intact minds of many sane people whose minds are closed. So it's also like, it's, it's almost like, um, psychology. Like you're like, what is real? Yeah. What? And as a doctor talking to this schizophrenic person, he's, he's very good about saying, separating, as you said, like his, his perceivement of what is reality. And this other person's it, the schizophrenic isn't lying. No. I mean, his reality is completely true to himself. So you have to like have compassion and understand um, the, 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 this, this um, sickness, I guess, and, and understand the person that these people are just really scared. Yeah. And like, 
what's happening? Why don't people think the same way? Yeah. I think that's what I really like about him. The author, um, RD Lang is that he, he treats them like people, not like what you, what were they saying? Like organisms of full of, uh, symptoms, like a lot of doctors especially yeah. back then tended to do. Uh, I know. <laughs> like he just saw the person. Yeah. Yeah. And when he wrote this, he was like 28 years old. That's crazy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's interesting. I do know someone who is, uh, who's schizophrenic and I, I did enjoy understanding some of the behavior and why it exists and it will, um, affect how I act. Because what about like the feeling like being smothered, like the love feels like hate, like, you know, I'm not going to be forceful. I'm not going to, and the person I know, he does look down and oh my gosh, now I see why he, it's hard for him to make eye contact. And now I understand why. Right. this This book I think is really, really wonderful. If, you know, if you are looking for that and there are some, Great case studies. Oh, but before we get to, like, there were a couple of case studies that I was like, whoa. Um, but there's a great quote. Um, okay, so which made me think of current events. A lot of these books have right. stuff that seems so current to me. So, a little girl of 17 in a mental hospital told me she was terrified because the atom bomb was inside her. That is a delusion. The statesmen of the world who boast and threaten that they have doomsday weapons are far more dangerous and far more estranged from reality than many of the people on whom the label psychotic is affixed. (laughs) I'm like, yep. (laughs) Chuckle there. Yep. Yeah. Preach RD preach. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, getting back to the book, I just thought that was brilliant. It is brilliant. And it's, uh, it's all very connected. It's just like, being able to see it, I guess, you know, like pay attention, everybody pay attention. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's crazy. And and the case studies were like, do you remember the one? I don't really like what about the blind girl. There was a blind girl and um, this boy who was schizophrenic was so happy to be in service of this blind girl because she was also getting neglected and he could be of service, but she didn't see him. Right. So he could kind of be invisible at the same time. And then like got her eyesight back somehow. And that's when his symptoms of schizophrenia started to come up because he was no longer, he found a way to make it work, but then she got better and he couldn't live in that world anymore. And he had to be seen and then being seen is too much, but all you want to do is be seen. Like, it's so crazy. Like, it's so crazy. Yeah. They go, like they go over in the book, he goes over and I won't get into each one of these things. Cause again, five hour podcast engulfment, implosion, petrification, and depersonalization. Like there's an interesting case also with this patient named James, um, which illustrates all these things beautifully. He makes people in his mind robots so that his aliveness isn't threatened and he can be human, even though he doesn't really see himself as human either. Like the things they have to do to survive. Right. Like you said, they don't want to survive, but they do want to survive. It's wild. Yeah. Absolutely wild. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what about the one with the girl who has the four uh, successive uh, dreams that her family members have turned to stone? And she awakens from the dream. She's not able to move for several minutes. And at the time of the dreams, like that these dreams started happening, she was like the picture of mental and physical health. Her family even called her the sunshine of the family. And 10 days after the fourth time she had the dream, she was taken ill with an acute form of schizophrenia displaying severe catatonic symptoms. So basically she fell fell into a state which was like the physical petrification of her family in the dreams. Which is like terrifying. What? Terrifying. Terrifying. Wow. Also like, whoa, what is the mind doing? The mind is is completely like a universe uh, beyond universe. Like, wow, how? How does that happen? It's crazy. How did it happen? I don't know. That terrified me. Uh, what? What? 
Like, yeah. And they say the three uh, three forms of anxiety is um, engulfment, implosion, and petrification for um, this guy psychosis. Like, yeah, she she did it. Ah, uh, yeah. Man, oh man. I do think another thing worth mentioning is I don't even know if I'm saying it's right, but his his he termed ontological insecurity. It basically becomes about preserving aliveness, like we were just saying, aliveness of oneself, aliveness of others. And when you're busy contriving ways of being real and keeping everyone else real, everyday occurrences, you know, they're bound to be threatening. So everyday things become just like huge. Right. And it's the individuals who have their, their real self undermined during childhood go on to develop this false self in order to interact with the world. These people are obviously at risk of developing, you know, psychosis under pressure. And when their real self dies and the false self that they've, you know, made to cope becomes overwhelmed and is no longer able to cope, then, ah, what are, what happens at this point? I think the person becomes like estranged from from society. Right. He, he or she can't experience themselves or anyone else is real. They invent, you know, the false self. It's like everything just disintegrates. Mm-hmm. And uh, ah. Yeah. And then there's the schizophrenic break. The break happens. Like, holy smokes. It kind of makes you look at things in a different light and it can just happen and you know it's kind of also terrifying yes like it it is take care of that mind and be take care of that mind and how you relate to the world and uh like and and how you relate in in your own body like how you are in your body is a huge thing like people they become concerned with self-preservation they fear becoming non-existent so they disassociate from their own their own body and from the external world. Right. And their own bodily experiences and actions become part of a false self, self system. And wow. It's it, and and it happens a lot when they they're trying to meet what they imagine to be others intentions and expectations. Right. You know, gosh your real self being authentic and being true to yourself. It's huge. It's huge. It's so important to honor and not living up to other, like not worrying about what other people think. Wow. That's a thing to really instill in a child. Like I was, as I was reading this, I was thinking about Asher, my, my kiddo. And I'm like, wow. You know, there are things that I think as a parent, you can do right and things that you can do incredibly wrong right exactly boy oh boy no they had um there was that girl um who's false false self like she had a very overbearing mother so she she kept saying that her face was um ugly and distorted and then she put like this crazy makeup on to make it look pretty but it, it looked like awful this awful makeup and so she had an overbearing mother and she couldn't hate her mother uh, yeah. or herself. So she hated the face that resembled her mother. And so it all became oh. about her face and like her like obsession with how awful it is instead of putting, being able to have the right to put it onto the person who's wronged you, you take it on and it be, and it warps and it becomes something completely. Um, it's like displacement yeah. almost. Right. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh, no. It's awful. You guys, there are so many case studies that are, it's really an interesting book. It is. It is a lot. It, we are not doing two episodes. No, we'll just put it that way. This is one and done. Um, it one and was, done. It was, uh, you know, it was hard, uh, but I think we learned a lot, which was really cool. Um, Absolutely. And I think like it is definitely, it's interesting because it's, it's a, I feel like this book, the theme is uh, the effort to communicate what being alive is like in the absence of assurances and the characteristics that someone might feel alive in. And I think that, that Bowie definitely communicated what it is like to be alive on so many levels with so many 
like personas and um, just the way the music moves you. Like he did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah, man. Yeah. So tell me, did you find a song that you feel uh, um, that this book reminded you of? Look, it was hard because the, it was, it's such a heavy book. Um, yeah. And I was like, oh, it's going to be a real angry, like distorted song. It's, it's not. It's, um, so the one I found it because of the lyrics, um, it's wild eyed boy from free cloud and it's on, um, I don't know what album it's on, but, uh, what the, the lyrics says, um, oh, it's the madness in his eyes. As he breaks the night to cry, it's really me, really you and really me. It's so hard for us to really be really you and really me. You'll lose me, though. I'm always really free. And I I thought that that kind of summarized it for me because it's just the the broken, the broken mind is really just trying to identify who, who it is and what it's supposed to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was good. That was good. Yeah. That, you like that? <laughs> I loved it. I did. I yeah, really did. And Wild Eyed Boy. Wild Eyed Boy from Free Cloud. I'm going to give that a listen. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So that one was, was I mean, the history is really interesting of um, his family, of Bowie's family through. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's. A, I can see why he read this book. Yeah. I really can. Mm-hmm. Oh, all right. You know, guys, we're moving on to another one and done. We're going to read next Strange People by Frank Edwards, and that will be one episode. So we're not splitting that one into two either. Nope. So one and done. So so go get that book. (laughs) Go get that book. Read along with us. And um, as always, feel free to tweet at 75 Reads. Follow us on Instagram at 75 Reads. And um, what else, Joe? And ah, and if you have a minute, go give us a, a little review on the iTunes just because it helps other Bowie fans and other music fans and bibliovores like ourselves uh, find the podcast and uh, have a little fun with us. So yeah, if you have a few minutes, uh, give us a little review. I that would be that. fantastic. Give the bibliovores a review. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and I think that is it, yeah? Yeah, we did it. All right. <laughs> Until next time, everybody. We will uh, see you soon. And, uh, yeah, tweet at us. We will tweet at you back. <laughs> All right. Woo-hoo. All right, bye.